Hello, this is Dr. Gandhi. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Frank Abagnale Jr.? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll go through the background in this case, then I'll move to my analysis. Frank Abagnale Jr. was born in the Bronx, New York, on April 27, 1948. He spent many of his early years in Bronxville, New York, which is about 15 miles north of Manhattan. When Frank was 12, his parents separated. After they divorced three years later, Frank lived with his father in Mount Vernon, New York. Frank made a number of claims throughout his life regarding his criminal career. Some of those claims have now been called into question or disproven. I'll review what he said he did, then I'll take a look at the other evidence which contradicts certain items of his account. Frank claimed that when he was 15 years old, he ran up $3,400 on his father's gas station credit card. He was sent to a reform school. He enlisted in the Navy in December of 1964, but he was discharged less than three months later. Not long after this, he was arrested for forgery. In 1965, Frank stole a Ford Mustang and financed a cross-country trip with blank checks from a business in New York. He drove from New York to California. Frank was arrested in California by the FBI. The case was transferred to New York. Frank was released early from custody, but he was rearrested after impersonating a pilot and eventually sentenced to three years in prison. Two years later, he was released but violated parole by stealing a car. He was sent back to prison for one year. Frank was released on December 24, 1968. He moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. There he impersonated a pilot. On February 14, 1969, he was arrested for vagrancy, but additional charges for theft and forgery were added when the police realized a few other items. Frank had a forged airline employee identification on him. He had stolen blank checks and had illegally driven his rental car out of the state of Florida. Frank was convicted on June 2, 1969, and sentenced to 12 years of probation. He fled to France, where he was arrested in September of 1969. He had stolen a vehicle in France and had defrauded people in Sweden. He served three months in a French prison before being extradited to Sweden and serving two months in prison there. 22-year-old Frank Abagnale was deported to the United States in June of 1970. He started traveling to various college campuses and passed bad checks as he impersonated a pilot. He claimed to be recruiting stewardesses for Pan Am. However, he never successfully recruited anyone using this scam. After cashing 10 forged Pan Am payroll checks, Frank was arrested by the FBI and placed in a jail in Georgia. He escaped only to be arrested four days later in New York City. Apparently, the guards had simply turned their backs, and Frank walked away. It was not a sophisticated escape. In 1971, Frank was convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison for forgery and two years for escaping from jail. He was released on parole in 1974. Not wanting to return to his family in New York, the court decided he would be released in Houston, Texas. So that's where probation officers would monitor him. Frank claimed that he worked in a few different jobs, like in a grocery store and in a movie theater. He was fired from most of his jobs after they found out he had a criminal record. He was arrested for stealing that same year, but he was only given a fine. Eventually, he took a job with Aetna, but they fired him for check fraud. They also filed a lawsuit against him. One of Frank's parole officers encouraged him to tell his story of being a transformed individual even though Frank hadn't transformed into anything. Frank apparently liked this idea. He started giving small lectures, promoting a story about his redemption. After this, the story kept getting larger. He said that he was a sociology professor for two semesters, a Pan Am pilot for two years, a physician in a hospital for one year, and an assistant state attorney general for one year. He supposedly accomplished all this between the ages of 16 and 21. 
Frank claimed that he worked for various banks as a check fraud consultant. He would tell them that he provided his services to Scotland Yard and the LAPD. In one of his newly developed tales, as he was being chased by the FBI in an airport in New York, he escaped from an aircraft lavatory as the plane was taxiing. Frank would later say that he escaped from the kitchen galley. In 1977, Frank made an appearance on the national television show To Tell the Truth. People were impressed by his story. Later that same year, he was featured on the Today Show with Tom Brokaw. Not long after this, he appeared on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson in what would be the first of several appearances on that show. In 1978, a number of local journalists debunked most of Frank's stories, but their reports only stayed local for the most part. Frank was gaining popularity on a national level. The articles debunking his nonsense barely slowed him down. On The Tonight Show, Frank addressed the articles by saying the people who spoke to those journalists were simply too embarrassed to admit they had been manipulated by a con artist. Frank appears to have spent much of his non-criminal career advising companies on how to secure documents, like checks. Many companies have paid him for his advice. He claims to be an expert on forgery, fraud, and theft. In 1980, Frank published a book, which he had co-written, titled Catch Me If You Can. In 2002, it was turned into a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio. At the time making this video, Frank continues to hold himself out as an expert on document security and fraud. Frank Abagnale and his wife Kelly live in South Carolina. Now moving to my analysis. In the movie, Catch Me If You Can, artistic license was employed to change some details about Frank's life. For example, in the movie, he stayed in touch with his father, but in reality, they stopped communicating early in his criminal career. Frank has made many claims that have been questioned. These are separate from the movie, like claims that he has made in speeches, in television appearances, and in his book, which is supposed to be a true story. Here are a few examples of claims that Frank has made which appear to be contradicted by credible evidence. Item number one. Frank said that he was arrested just one time in his criminal career. This arrest was in France. In reality, Frank was arrested not only in France, but also in California, Georgia, Louisiana, Massachusetts, New York, and Texas. Item number two, Frank said that during his criminal career, he never ripped off individuals or small businesses. His victims were big, faceless corporations. He made it seem as though he never really hurt anyone. In reality, Frank did commit crimes against individuals and small businesses. For example, he once stole property from his co-workers at a kid's camp in Texas. Maybe it was one of those big corporate kid's camps. Item number three, Frank claimed that he worked as a consultant for the FBI for many years. He has given some lectures at the FBI Academy, but no one from the FBI has ever made a public statement about what Frank has or has not done for them. Frank said that he was included in a 100th anniversary coffee table book published by the FBI. His name appears nowhere in that book. Item number four, Frank said that he passed the bar exam in Louisiana and worked as an assistant attorney general. During this time, he closed 33 cases. There is no record of Frank ever being a member of the Louisiana bar. He never worked as an assistant attorney general either. Item number five, Frank said that he worked as a sociology professor at Brigham Young University for two semesters. He later suggested that the co-writer of his book may have exaggerated this. In reality, Frank was the one who made this claim, not the co-writer. In 2006, Frank changed his story a little and suggested that perhaps he was a guest lecturer and not a professor. Item number six, Frank said that in 1971, he escaped from the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. During an interview in 1982, he said, quote, I was and still am the only and youngest man to escape from that prison, unquote. According to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, Frank was never in that prison. I guess that just proves how good an escape artist Frank was. He not only broke out of prison, he destroyed any record that he was ever there. Item number seven, 
Frank claimed that he had stolen $2.5 million from the airline Pan Am using bad checks. The actual amount was less than $1,500. Perhaps math isn't Frank's strong suit. Item number eight, Frank claims to have several patents which have earned millions of dollars for him. In reality, neither Frank nor his company holds any patents. Item number nine, Frank was incarcerated in the state of New York between the ages of 17 and 20, which was the time when he claimed to commit some of his more notorious crimes. In 2002, Frank addressed some of the inconsistencies in his story. He essentially said that the co-writer of his book took some liberties with the truth, exaggerating certain points and being overly dramatic. What's interesting about Frank placing the blame on his co-writer is that Frank made some of these claims three years before the book was published. When considering all the evidence in this case, what do I think happened? Was Frank really a legendary con artist who became a crusader for justice or a small time criminal who was only a master of exaggeration? Here's my theory about what happened. This is just my opinion. When Frank was young, he decided to become a small time criminal, mostly stealing from targets of opportunity. He wasn't very good at it. He was arrested and convicted several times. When his parole officer had the idea of Frank talking about his magical and non-existent transformation into a respectable citizen, Frank became excited about the idea of gaining attention and money, promoting a dramatic and largely fictional version of his life. It was an opportunity for him to rewrite his story, to become the person he wanted to be. He developed these fantastical stories about impersonating a professor, physician, attorney, an airline pilot. He was such an efficient criminal that he embarrassed the FBI. Many agents chased him for years. To top it all off, he made it seem as though he never really hurt anyone. He just defrauded big companies. After Frank appeared on television, many people were fascinated by his story. They liked the idea of a charming con artist who essentially made a mockery of the educated. Frank's stories reinforced the idea that there's nothing special about people who have high-level careers. Anyone could impersonate a professional, and nobody would know the difference. In addition, he only defrauded big, evil, faceless corporations, as if the money stolen from these corporations doesn't ultimately come out of the pockets of individuals. Frank was a villain turned folk hero who was there to help people battle against the real criminals. He would reveal all the secrets of the villains and help keep people safe. People could trust Frank because he had redeemed himself. He was using his powers of manipulation for good. Frank was able to launch and maintain a career based on these lies. When Hollywood bought into his nonsensical story, Frank's popularity skyrocketed. His story must be true. Big Hollywood stars verified it, and everyone knows that research is their specialty. Now moving to my final thoughts. Several people have suggested that Frank was just an unsuccessful, creepy, small-time con artist. When he was young, this appears to be true. His greatest scam occurred after his criminal career had concluded. He tricked everybody into believing he was the world's greatest con artist. He finally found the type of scam where he could be proficient. Most criminals lie to cover up their crimes. Frank lied to amplify his. The same narcissistic characteristics that lead someone to be a con artist can also motivate them to gain admiration. The irony of this case is that Frank set out to prove he was a great con artist. He has been successful in that mission. He manipulated people into believing that instead of a petty and selfish criminal, he was a remarkable and magnanimous criminal. Some people are shocked and disappointed. They just can't believe that a person who manipulated and defrauded people could ever be deceptive. Those are my thoughts on Frank Abagnale Jr. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.